Do you buy Palm Apartments? Amanda speaking. How can I help you? Oh, hi, Amanda. I'm ringing to inquire about a holiday apartment for the month after next. Okay, no problem. Let me get your details first, then I'll tell you what we've got. Is that all right? Fine, go ahead. Okay. Can I have your name first, please? Yes, it's Leo Blücher. That's L E O. That's my first name, and my surname is B L U C H E R. Okay, I've got that. Where are you from? Just out of interest, Leo. I'm Austrian. Right. Okay. And what's your address? It's number thirty-seven Blumengasse in Vienna. Right. Could you just spell Blumengasse for me, please, Leo? My German's not too good. Sure. It's B L U M E N G A W S E. Great. Thanks. And what's the weather like in Vienna at the moment? It's pretty grey and rainy, I'm afraid. <laughs> Hope it's better in Dubai. Yes, it's lovely at the moment. Sunny and warm, but not too hot. Now, can you give me your phone number? Yes, it's four three one two, double one zero five seven. Great. So, you're looking for a holiday apartment, Leo. How many people is it for? Just yourself? No, there'll be four of us: two adults and two children. Fine. And when would you like it from? Ideally, from the first of January. January the first. Okay. I'll have a look and see what we've got. How long would you like to stay? Well, it depends a little bit on the price, but I think that about nine days would be perfect. Fine. And talking of prices, what would be your maximum? Do you think? Well, I've looked on the internet, but I don't know if I'm being realistic if I say two hundred euros per day. Things seem to range from one hundred and fifty to well over four hundred. Well, it depends where, of course, but I think we could probably find something for you at that price. Great. There are various other things, though. Our children are quite small, and we don't want to take them to restaurants all the time. So one thing we'd really appreciate is a fully equipped kitchen, so we can do some cooking. Yes, I completely understand. Do you have any other special requirements? Yes, we live in the city centre, hundreds of miles from the sea. So we'd really like to be able to see it from our apartment. Okay, I'll note that down. All our apartments come with air conditioning and central heating, by the way. Oh dear! One thing I don't like is the noise of air conditioning in the background. Can you make sure it's as quiet as possible? Yes, I'll look into that. Anything else? Yes, just one more thing.、Uh, we'd like to hire a car while we're in Dubai, so we'll need to have a parking space. I think we don't want to have to walk a long way from the car to the apartment. I think you're quite right. I'll look into all these things and make a list of possible apartments. Do you have an email address so I can send them to you? Now turn to section two. Section two, 
You'll hear a talk between a host and a professor called Alison Downing about cocoa beans. First, you have some time to look at questions 11 to 16. Now listen carefully and answer questions 11 to 16. Hello and welcome to today's talk. Here with me is the famous botanist, Professor Alison Downing. So, Alison, tell us something about cocoa beans. Cocoa beans, also called cacao beans, are the primary constituent in making chocolate, grown in tropical areas in South and Central America, West Africa and Asia. The cocoa tree is often raised on small, family-owned farms. When the harvested pods are open to expose the beans, the pulp and cocoa seeds are removed and the rind is discarded. The pulp and seeds are then piled in heaps, placed in bins or laid out on grates for several days. During this time, the seeds and pulp undergo a process called sweating, where the thick pulp liquefies as it ferments. The fermented pulp trickles away, leaving cocoa seeds behind to be collected. This is when the beans are harvested and then the bags holding them are ready to be transported. But the most important step in processing the cocoa bean is cleaning it. Once the beans are unloaded from the railroad cars, the packages are opened and then weighed by machines. Then the pods are split and the seeds or beans are covered with a sweet white pulp or mucilage. On arrival at the factory, the cocoa beans are sorted and put in a hopper to be cleaned more rigorously. The wet beans are then transported to a facility so they can be fermented and dried. They are fermented for four to seven days and must be mixed every two days. They are dried for five to 14 days, depending on the climate conditions. The fermented beans are dried by spreading them out over a large surface and constantly raking them. Then the beans are ready to be roasted. Now, Roasting takes place at a high temperature and then the beans are boiled in a heated chamber. During the roasting process, the beans will be expanded and cracked. But prior to this, the beans are trodden and shuffled about using bare human feet. During this process, red clay mixed with water is sprinkled over the beans to obtain a finer colour polish and protection against moulds during shipment to factories in the United States, the Netherlands, the United Kingdom and other countries. Now, back to what I was saying. After the beans are cracked, they need to be cooled. Then the roasted beans are sealed in pockets. Before you hear the rest of the talk, you have some time to look at questions 17 to 20. Now listen and answer questions 17 to 20. Wow, that is not a simple process, is it? But someone told me that different roasting levels of coffee can lead to different kinds of flavours. Yes, roasting coffee transforms the chemical and physical properties of green coffee beans into roasted coffee products. The roasting process is what produces the characteristic flavour of coffee by causing the green coffee beans to change in taste. Unroasted beans contain similar if not higher levels of acids, protein, sugars and caffeine as those that have been roasted. But lack the taste of roasted coffee beans due to the Maillard and other chemical reactions that occur during roasting. 
The vast majority of coffee is roasted commercially on a large scale, but small-scale commercial roasting has grown significantly with the trend toward single-origin coffees served at specialty shops. Some coffee drinkers even roast coffee at home as a hobby in order to both experiment with the flavour profile of the beans and ensure the freshest possible roast. So here I'm going to introduce some of these roasted coffee beans and their special flavours. Now, the first crack is lighter bodied and has a higher acidity level with no obvious roast flavour and is popular for its special mild taste. This level of roast is ideal for tasting the full original character of the coffee. The green beans are raw, unroasted coffee beans. They are strictly hard beans with a smoky flavour and a slightly acidic. We've also got French roast, and the flavour that comes across in French roast coffee usually has more to do with the roasting process than the actual quality of the beans. By the time the beans are dark enough to qualify as French, most of their original flavour has dissipated. In its place come the flavours of caramelising sugar, bittersweet coffee and often a bit of chocolate. And finally, espresso smoky. That is, coffee brewed by forcing a small amount of nearly boiling water under pressure through finely ground coffee beans. Espresso is generally thicker than coffee brewed through other methods, has a higher concentration of suspended and dissolved solids, and has creamer on top. As a result of the pressurised brewing process, the flavours and chemicals in a typical cup of espresso are very concentrated. Espresso is also the base for other drinks, such as café latte, cappuccino, café macchiato, café mocha, flat white or café americano. That is the end of section two. You now have half a minute to check your answers. Now turn to section 3 on page 114. Section 3. In this section, you will hear an interview with a wildlife specialist called Alison Sharp talking about bears. In the first part of the discussion, they are talking about the history of the bear. First, look at questions 21 to 23. Now listen to the first part of the interview and answer questions 21 to 23. Alison Sharp has spent much of her life researching bears, and in particular, bears in danger of extinction. She is the author of a recent book on bears, and we welcome her to the studio today. Thank you. Delighted to be here. First of all, can you give us a quick overview of the history of the bear family? Well, the bears we know today actually have as their ancestors bears which have been evolving for some 40 million years. We have fossils of the earliest true bear, and it's important to emphasize this because some creatures are called bears but are not. Such as koalas, for instance. <laughs> yes, exactly. Fossils of the true bear show a small dog-sized animal with characteristics that show a blending of dog and bear traits. So the general belief is that 
dogs and bears were of the same family? Yes, that's the theory. And then we see the arrival of the early cave bear. We know from cave drawings that Neanderthal man used to worship this bear and at the same time fear it. Understandable, perhaps. Uh, yes, but they need not have worried because the cave bear only ate plants. Ah. <laughs> <laughs> In fact, the cave bear survived two ice ages, but then became extinct. In the second part of the interview, Alison talks more about the situation of bears today. Look at questions 24 to 30 first. Listen carefully and answer questions 24 to 30. So, how many bears can we find today? And are any of them in danger of extinction? Well, I'll answer your first question first. There are eight species of bear in all, among them the American black bear and the brown bear, from which evolved the newest species of bear, the polar bear. So... How old is the polar bear? Oh, he's a relative newcomer, just 20,000 years old. And could you tell us a little about them? Which is the largest bear, for instance? Well, the largest bear existing today is either the polar bear or the brown bear. Right. Don't we know? <laughs> well, it depends which criteria you use. The polar bear is the heaviest. The male weighs up to 1,500 pounds, but his narrow body actually makes him look smaller than the much more robust brown bear. So the brown bear appears the biggest? Yes. And the smallest? Well, the sun bear is the smallest of the eight species. They only weigh between 60 and 145 pounds. That makes him a comparative junior. <laughs> yes. And then next we have the so-called giant panda, but that's a small bear too, comparatively speaking. And are all bears meat eaters? No, not at all. In fact, the giant panda is almost entirely herbivorous, living on a diet of 30 types of bamboo. Oh, yes, of course. Pandas are famous for that. <laughs> and another interesting bear is the sloth bear, which eats insects, particularly termites. Mm. He can turn his mouth into a tube and suck the insects out of their nests. So, going back to my second question, mm -hmm. are bears really in danger of extinction? Yes, indeed, they are. The sun bear in particular, as they've been hunted almost out of existence. And the habitat of the panda is also being reduced on a daily basis. Can anything be done to reduce the threat to these endangered species? I know, for instance, that it's very hard to breed bears in captivity. Yes. Well... I think that by raising people's awareness generally, we can reduce conflict between humans and animals to stop the slaughter in parts of the world where bears are still hunted, supposedly in self-defense or to protect livestock, but often quite unnecessarily. And we can also encourage governments to preserve the natural environment of the bear rather than allow the areas where they live to be systematically destroyed in the name of progress. Yes, of course. And in addition to these global efforts, all profits from the sale of my book will go toward the United Nations Bear Protection Program. That's wonderful. And with the news coming up, thank you for your time, Alison, and best of luck with the book. Thank you very much. That is the end of Section 3. You now have half a minute to check your answers.
Now turn to section four. Section four. You will hear a lecture on climate change. First, you have some time to look at questions thirty-one to forty. Listen carefully and answer questions thirty-one to forty. This lecture in environmental studies is on the topic of human influence on climate change. First, I'll outline some of the factors affecting climate, then go on to discuss what has already occurred, and finish up by speculating on the effects. Previously. We've covered how factors such as ocean currents and prevailing winds affect climate change naturally. However, the influence of human activity on climate is what I'll talk about today. At first, the effect on the climate was relatively small. Trees were cut down to provide fuel for fires, and as we know, trees absorb carbon dioxide. And produce oxygen, so the amount of carbon dioxide in the atmosphere would have increased, but not noticeably. So, in what ways has human activity really impacted on the climate? A major contributor was the advent of the industrial revolution at the end of the 18th century, combined with the invention of the combustion engine. In addition, Earth's burgeoning population has had a marked effect on climate. The first two factors. Saw increased amounts of carbon dioxide being released into the atmosphere from the burning of fossil fuels such as coal and oil. The final one, human expansion, has resulted in deforestation on such a scale that the extra carbon dioxide in the air cannot be soaked up and converted into oxygen by the remaining trees. Okay, so what has already happened? Well. Global temperatures have risen by 0.6 degrees Celsius in the last 130 years. Levels of carbon dioxide, methane, and nitrous oxide gases have escalated. Carbon dioxide concentrations have climbed by 30 percent, and methane levels have increased by 145 percent since the beginning of the Industrial Revolution. Gas produced by fossil fuel extraction, livestock. And paddy fields is primarily responsible for the growth of methane levels. Nitrous oxide, or N2O, comes from natural sources, wet tropical forests, for instance. But it is also produced by human-related activities, such as agriculture, which uses synthetic nitrogen fertilizers, rubbish disposal systems, and vehicle emissions. How do gases like carbon dioxide and methane affect the climate? Well, this is what we call the greenhouse effect. Under normal conditions, the sun's rays hit the Earth, and some are reflected back into space. However, these gases, CO2 and methane, create a barrier in the atmosphere, which prevents a proportion of the sun's rays from being reflected back into space, and instead, the gases become trapped in the atmosphere. It's simple, really. Because the sun's rays can't escape, the Earth heats up. What are the possible effects? Firstly, a rise in sea levels. We already know that the Arctic ice cap has melted and shrunk considerably, and great chunks of ice have been lost from Antarctica. In 1998, it was reported that 46 million people lived in areas at risk of flooding, and the number of people at risk. Will increase significantly if sea levels rise. It is estimated that a rise of only 50 centimeters would put that number at 92 million. Further projections would see a rise of one meter put 118 million people in danger of losing their homes and livelihoods, not to mention the loss of prime fertile farmland. Experts predict a rise of at least 50 centimeters over the next 50 years or so. Secondly. There would be a modification of vegetation zones, with changes in the boundaries between grassland, shrubland, forest, and desert. 
This is already causing famine in arid areas of northeastern Africa and has instigated, and will continue to instigate, mass movements of people away from dry regions. What we are seeing now is only the first stage. With temporary camps for climate refugees already at overcapacity, in the future, there will be significant migration resulting in extreme overcrowding of towns and cities. Another potentially disastrous effect of climate change is an increase in the range and distribution of pests which could bring about an increase in the prevalence of certain diseases. If we think of the malaria-carrying mosquito, for example, which thrives in warmer regions, at the moment, about 45% of the world's population is exposed to malaria. But, with an increase in temperature, there will be many millions more cases of malaria a year. The last effect I'm going to mention today is the change in ecosystems. Global warming will influence species composition for both fauna and flora, such that some animal species will disappear and others will multiply. And it'll be the same for plants and trees. It is predicted that around two-thirds of the world's forests will undergo major changes of some kind. Scientists also expect deserts will become hotter and, of course, desertification will continue at an increasingly worrying rate and will become harder, if not impossible, to reverse. What could we do to stop the process? Well, that's the subject of next week's lecture. So, I hope to see you all there. That is the end of section 4. You now have half a minute to check your answers.